to use GIS is to have one disk set up for each task you want to use. So if you want to have one set up for word processing, you'll have one with GeoWrite and all the associated tools. You might have one that's set up for programming. This makes that really easy. So I'm going to go into the GeoWrite image, and I can just double click on it, and it'll, it'll go behind the scenes and do the CD commands and whatever, and now we're on a different disk image. So let's take a little bit of a look at GeoWrite. Here are some font files. And fonts are kind of like the big deal of GS. And like I said, there's about a million of them. I've got a Laura Ipsum file here that I'm going to bring up. Now, I said GS is a lot more I.O. bound than it is CPU bound, but there are things that will take a long time. And one of them is screen redraws. So for example, if I wanted to put some text right in the middle here, it's going to have to redraw everything else, and it's going to have to keep on doing that. And if you think, these are proportional fonts, okay? So it's got to be measuring the width of the font every time, and they're also at arbitrary point sizes. So none of this is fitting into 8 by 8 character cells. So it's got to do that every time. So if I try and put something in the middle here, it's got to reflow the text every time. And that, that's really even more true if you decide you're going to, for example, set the margins wide. Okay, and this is, this is where the 128 guys tell me that I should be you know, using a 128. Because as you, now as you type, you'll go back and forth, which is not a good thing. So, if you want to actually do something interesting with GeoWrite and do a fairly large document, the way to do it is to set the margins so that everything will appear on the screen at once, and then you enter it, a draft version of it like this, and then you widen the margins and put in all the font changes and stuff like that. That's the biggest trick for using uh, GeoWrite and getting some good response out of it. But let me just show you the business with the fonts because it's really pretty impressive. So here I'm just going to change to this font, which is an 18 point font. Yep, there it is. Or let me go and change this portion to a different font. What have I got? I don't even know what these are. Okay, there's another interesting one. And let's see, here's some more. What fonts have we got? This one's beautiful. Whoops. If you're a GIS programmer, there are two ways to do menus, and one of them is so that the mouse can't slip off them. That's the way you should do it. Because otherwise, what you just saw will So you can see this is, this is like, the big deal with GIS is fonts. It's really a document-oriented operating system. It's good for word processing, it's good for desktop publishing, and uh, you know, stuff like this is just wonderful. But there are all different kinds of fonts in GS. One of the things you can do with GS is to get it to generate PostScript output. And I guess this is where we pass these around. Can you just shift them around the room? Um, the other one, the other program I want to start up next is GeoPublish, which is like the ultimate GS program. And I used a program that will take a regular file like this and output PostScript, which you can then either convert to PDF or print it if your printer supports PostScript or whatever. You'll be able to see that better when the lights come on, I guess. But, uh, but you have to use special fonts for that. These regular standard GS fonts, you'll get the same jaggies that you see here on the, on the page. But if you look at that page, especially the heading, which you can probably see even in this light, I mean, it's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. But you have to use special what are called laser writer fonts. Oh, one other thing I wanted to show is the uh, desk accessories, a program that you can run from within another program. So suppose you have some bits of text that you might want to put in at various places in a program, headers, footers, stuff you might use in programming, like line delimiters and stuff like that. I'm going to load the text manager. You can see there's quite a bit of 
disc access while it does this. So it actually carved out, you know, you can think of where that window appears and imagine that as being like the window of memory that he carved out and saved to disc in order to be able to run this. So now I've got a couple of different tech scraps here. Like I said, tech scraps are saved to disc, not memory. So let's take this one. This one looks really nice. And I'm going to say copy. Now I'm going to dismiss the desk accessory. It's going to go back and load that chunk of memory back in, reset the state of the machine. Oh, that was pretty fast. It takes longer to start one of those. But now that I've got that copy to the text scrap, I can just go Commodore T to paste. And there it is. But again, all that comes off the disk. And if you try this on a floppy drive on a 1541 or even a 1581, it's not going to be a whole lot of fun. But this is, you know, to me, this is more than acceptable speed on a machine this size. Glenn, how did you get this? Because uh, I've done stuff with PostScript and Geos before, but how did you get this graphic in here? It's magic. It's magic? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just pasted it in. Really? And it came out looking like that? Well, Let's let's actually go and look at that file. <laughs> that geo published file. Yeah, that is geo published. By yes. is a, that uh, is my geo text published. looks like this, but I, all my graphics look like typical blocky. That that graphic, I took the Geos boot thing, and you know how in Geo Paint, when you paste a graphic, you can say, do you want me to to center it or do you want me to stretch it to fit the area? Uh -huh. Okay, I took that graphic as was it 24 by 24 or 24 by 21? Right. And I said, and I pasted it into a 48 by 48 square, oh, okay. and I said double it. But then after I did that, I hand edited it. I cheated. So you could see there is still some pixel jagginess. Okay, I'm going to take micro IEC switch again, and I'm going to switch to a different D81 image, which is my uh, GeoPublish one. And I call it GeoPub Laser. I'll just do it this way to show that I can click the icon as well. And also for those of you that are interested in the way this stuff is programmed, I've got a binder with a hard copy of the source code for this for that app that we just saw. And uh, you can have a look at that if you like. So here is uh, GeoPublish, which, oh, you know, one other thing I want to show about GeoPublish. Um, you know, I mentioned how uh, a lot of these programs are written so that they have overlays and there, there are several distinct chains of... Uh, sectors that make up these programs. Here's GeoPublish. Let's bring up the info block on this. Wait, it's how big? <laughs> right? <laughs> the Commodore, Commodore 99 this machine is called? Wait, oh, oh yeah, right. So obviously not all of this is loaded into memory at one time. So let me go to the page where this is. Here, here are some examples of these fonts. By, tr by, uh, by convention, they're named with an LW in front, standing for laser writer, because the way this stuff was originally done is that you hook a uh, RS-232 adapter to the back of your Commodore and hook the other end of that to an Apple laser writer or use some kind of adapter. I don't know, I've never had one of those. But that's the way it was done in the old days, is that you would, you would uh, hook this up and do it over serial, and it would print directly to your printer, and God only knows how long that took. There was also a service and Julian will correct me. Yeah. Uh, on CompuServe, where you could give them your was it PostScript output from GeoPublish? It was yeah. it was meant for Geo's users, and they would laser print. Exactly. On a probably a fairly ordinary laser printer. That mail it back to, and I want to say it was a dollar a page. There was a an also a modem based service. They advertised it in some of those boxes mm -hmm. of Geo's where you could. Yeah. I'd love to know how many people use that at a at a buck plus a page. Well, that laser was. Printing. You know, I could see doing that if you were doing a newsletter for your for your user group. Mm. You have one good copy printed, and then you uh, Xerox the rest. Yeah. 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 Sure. How would you do that now? I mean, you still need to go get an Apple, an, an old Apple laser writer, or is there something <coughs> more more mod modern that will print? Well, this is this, this is raw PostScript. This is a raw PostScript file. So, so any, any, post any printer, printer that'll, that'll any printer that supports PostScript, okay. right? And serial. Don't tell my boss, but I printed this at work. <laughs> You'd still I need took, a serial actually, uh, I took the interface. PostScript file, put it on a, on a uh, USB floppy connected to my laptop, right, and then mailed it to myself at work. And then when I got to work, I just didn't. Uh, dump the PostScript to... Uh, yeah, dump the PostScript. For direct connection to a Commodore, you would still need a serial printer? 
Uh, uh, a printer with a yeah. serial interface, rather. And and I'm gonna I'll be the first to admit I'm not an expert yeah. on this stuff. This is all kind of new to me. The the program that was originally used with an Apple laser writer got hacked at some point to generate the output to the to, mm -hmm. to a disk file instead. Mm -hmm. And it's got some real uh, how shall I say idiosyncrasies because of the number of hacks it's been through to get where it is now. Uh, let me find the program here and I'll, uh, how much BIS? This is, uh, by the way, this is the uh, file, this is the postcard file. Oh, that's not right. That's the wrong file. Hang on. No, it's this way. This is the postscript file for what you're looking at, what you're holding in your hand. And it's 16 kilobytes, right? So that's not bad at all. And since I have 121K free on this image, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this file, and then I'll show you what I mean by idiosyncrasies in the program that generates the uh, postscript. Let me just rename this to, uh, I'll just make it like this. And then I'll go back and uh, see where it is. Yeah, these are some more of those laser fonts. Here we go. These are the, this is the program that does it. And I'm on drive B, so I'm going to use this version of it. And I don't think there's any really interesting information here. No. Oh, yeah. Uh, you do have to use the 1.1 version of GeoPublish if you're going to do this stuff. So now I'll show you what happens because this is really this is really kind of amusing. It, it starts off by asking you. Well, it'll ask you first of all, of course, which uh, which file you want to use. <laughs> do I want to put it on drive A at 9,600 bucks? Uh, okay, you can see that the guy that hacked this program didn't bother to uh, do stuff like that. Um, so now it's going to ask me which one. This is the this is the one. And okay, do I want all this? This is this is kind of interesting stuff too. So now I say, okay, go ahead and generate the postscript file. Do not attempt to adjust the vertical. Do not attempt to adjust the horizontal. Gios is in control. <laughs> <laughs> so you could see what he's doing, I and mean, it's pretty obvious. He's right. He's directly into screen memory. Yeah. So you know. I, a good hack would have been to switch the screen off or something so that we don't have to look at this. Is that worth it? Uh, in the Word uh, doc files that are in the regular I'm sorry? non geo published files? Can you do that with uh, other? Oh, you can see it's done already, so it didn't take a long time to do it. I, I, before I answer that, I just want to say there's one other one other idiosyncrasy that this program has. I don't know how it does it, but the reason I renamed the existing copy of the postscript file is because if you do it again when it's already on the disk, it'll create another file with the exact same name. Oh. And that is not a good thing. I don't even know how it does it. It's got to be writing directly to the directory center or something. Um, I'm sorry, the question was... Oh, can, you, can you use this with GeoWrite then, too? You can do it with GeoWrite. If we look, if I can find the page of those programs right on page two, yes. These two, this one's called GeoPub Laser, GeoPub Laser Disk B. This, they sent output to drive A or to drive B. This one, GeoLaser, not GeoPub Laser, but GeoLaser, will do GeoWrite documents. Yeah. And I took, in fact, I took, uh, I took the source code for that micro IC switch program and printed it out this way. And it, it, it looked great. It printed the standard GIOS font in all its jaggy glory. You know? <laughs> the, the jaggies were perfect. Yeah. So that's what it'll do if you don't use a laser disk. Um, so I wanted to actually show that GeoPublish uh, file. So this is at GeoTips. That's what you're holding in your hand. And where I left off last time I edited, edited this, I did on purpose to <coughs> show you. This this is why GS, people complain about GS. You can see, look at the look at the screen redraws and what's all being done. There's the boot. There's the text above and below. There's the text there. So look how long it took just to redraw the screen. If you're going to move around on the screen, you could have a problem. But uh, you know, I showed you the. 
the, the trick with the margins and the not, not using the fonts until the end and GeoWrite. Here's a trick with GeoPublish. How about if we don't actually display the special text, which is that up and down text, and let's don't actually display bitmaps, which is the boot. Okay. Now let's redraw the screen. Well, it's still going to take a little time because it's got to go out and get all those other text files from disk. But now it's just going to do this, and it's going to put a placeholder there. Oh, okay. So if you want to, uh, if you want to do some work with GeoPublish, learn some of these tricks. It can make your life easier and, and you won't cry as much, uh, but it's still extremely powerful and you can get a lot out of it. Uh, any questions about GS, how to use it, how to get it? Yeah. You, you mentioned before that a super CPU probably isn't as necessary as fast I.O., but these redraws are s slow enough, it seems like maybe it would speed it up. Does a super CPU speed up the it, redraws? It, it really would. You know, what, what I wrote on <coughs> one slide was for most cases, for most data. It's it's overkill. This is a classic example of where you could really use a, okay. a, an accelerator. The other one is if you're doing a lot of program development. Okay, sure. Because you're going to be doing really intense search and replaces and moving through 20-page documents mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, that's another thing you want to avoid, by the way, if you're using GeoWrite. Remember what I said that each page is essentially another file on disk. So. If you have a 10-page document and you insert some, fi some, some text on page one, guess what's going to happen, right? It's going to reflow, it's going to rewrite page two, it's going to reflow, it's going to rewrite page three, and so on and so on. So they're all little tricks to get around that. Okay? All right. Has anyone ever ripped up and, and rebuilt geos, you know, super geos, to deal with these disk routines, the, the different issues that were endemic to the old hardware? Well made one specifically I mean, for super i know there's wings uh, but and things like that yeah made something specifically for the super cpu specifically for fast disk no i mean wheels supported the super cpu out of the box right, right. and mm -hmm. uh, but what does that really mean it supported it all you need is some patches in the io routines that slow it down and speed it up where it needs to so that the io doesn't you know break down and stuff um but this is you know, the machine is what it is, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, you can, there's only so much you can do. I do actually have a Super CPU with me. If anybody wants to see what it looks like on a C Super CPU, I've got it and I'll have that at my table. So if you want to see what GS looks like when you have to scrape the bits off the ceiling with a spatula. Is all GS source out there? Uh, the original GS source I don't think is out there. I was trying to get a hold of the guy who was the Geo Programmer Project Lead. I hmm. managed to find him online. Oh, wow. But I, he uh, apparently doesn't spend a lot of time on his Google Plus account. So, uh, um, or on but GS. there is, there is, however, a reverse engineered GS that a guy over in Poland, Poland did. He took the entire source code and reverse engineered it, and you can download that. I've got it on my site. You can download wow. it and look through it. That it's really interesting. It's a really interesting read for those of you that are programmers. You learn a lot just by reading that, especially if you look at the font routines. How do they do these fonts at arbitrary point sizes? You know, it's a big deal. Awesome. Okay.